When there's a problem in the sermon, it's ours. And when it goes well, it's God's. And so our goal is to look at how we can participate and be involved in the sermonic process in a way that God has ordained to allow his power to shine through in the gospel. Welcome back to Roundtable, a podcast produced by Mid-America Reformed Seminary. I'm Jared Luchibor, and it is my pleasure to bring to you this special episode number 16. This is one that's going to be outside of our regular cycle of discussions with our faculty. Um, But this past month, we had second and third year students arrive on campus before the second semester officially kicked off. Uh, They came to take an intensive interim class. Uh, There's a new class that's offered each year, and this January happened to be one on advanced preaching, specifically uh, on communicating God's voice in our weakness. It's a class that seeks to uh, teach advanced principles for communicating God's word with a primary focus upon the preached sermons. So uh, here to elaborate more on that and joining us here on campus to teach this interim class is Reverend Greg Bilsma. He's an alumnus of 2005 and pastor of Living Water Reformed Church in Brantford, Ontario, up in Canada. Reverend Bilsma, uh, Greg, thanks for being here. Good to be here, Jared. It's nice to be with you and good to be on campus again. Absolutely. So uh, this is an interim class. It's taught from a Monday to a Friday for many hours each day. Um, it's, it's given this brief description. Uh, the class goes something like this. Students will be encouraged uh, to find their voice in preaching while maintaining a gospel focus and accessibility that can reach and edify a broad spectrum of listeners. Uh, The crafting and delivery of the message will be emphasized through focused attention on strengths and weaknesses of each student's current homiletical method. So using that as a foundation for what is being taught, can you just kind of build upon that and elaborate for just a moment on uh, the particulars of this class, and even how it's uh, different from a normal homiletics or preaching class. So in this class, we would spend a lot less time than you would in homiletics on the foundations of preaching. We'd assume those things. Uh, we'd assume you understand the importance of preaching. Uh, but what we kind of delve into is how you move practically to a sermon, to be honest, to powerful preaching. Um, what does God use to allow his word to come across in power? And how do we participate in that as essential um, essential instruments in God's hand, and yet not what we might call causative instruments? That is to say, the power is never from us. We've got to be there. God uses human mouthpieces. Uh, when there's a problem in the sermon, it's ours. And when it goes well, it's God's. And so our goal is to look at how we can participate and be involved in the sermonic process in a way that God has ordained to allow his power to shine through in the gospel. And so we've looked at the means that God chooses to bless, things like uh, making sure we're word-centered, things like dependence upon the Holy Spirit and preaching in the Spirit, uh, things like making sure the gospel and Christ are central, looking at verses like, uh, you know, um, I'm under compulsion, woe is me, if I preach not the gospel from 1 Corinthians 9, to see that while we preach the word, the word will always point to Christ, always exalt Christ. And so our sermons have to have Christ, not just at the end, uh, but all through. And then finally, we look at the importance of application, and that application is one of the required parts of the sermon if God is going to speak in power. He's speaking to a people, he's addressing sin, and we have to make sure the congregation realizes this sermon is not something we just observe, but something that calls for response, involves us, undoes us, and then builds us back up again in the Savior. What's um, the significance of this class for students as they move ahead? What are What's just one thing that you would really want them to take away from this as they forge through the remainder of their seminary education and then on into, Lord willing, pastoral ministry? Yeah, the one thing I'd want them to take away, that's that's good. I think I think the idea that they can have confidence in the pulpit that God will speak. One of the verses we hit early on was Romans 15, I believe it's verse 27, where Paul writes to the Roman church and says to them something along these lines, that when I come to you, I'm confident I'll come to you in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. And that's uh, certainly not what students feel coming to the pulpit, and it's often not what experienced preachers feel coming to the pulpit, that will come with the fullness of the blessing of Christ. And yet it's something we can confess and believe 
if we are using God's means, if we are relying upon the Lord and showing that reliance in the way we prepare our sermons for a word-based, Christ-centered, gospel-focused, applicatory sermon in the power of the Spirit. Uh, So I want them to be able to come into the preaching to grow personally, to see how their own preaching needs to mature, evolve, uh, focus on application, and to proclaim Christ in a way that is accessible and uh, glorious. What have been some of the... uh or what are some preaching challenges you faced at the beginning of, or after a few years into uh, your ministry that shaped how you approached this class? Preaching problems in the beginning of ministry. There's so many to, to, to mention. I don't know if I could get them all. Uh, that's actually part of the fun of, of seeing a class like this. Um, looking back at the first response I had after preaching my first sermon, I'm shaking hands at the door as people leave. And I have an beautiful elderly saint who comes up to me and tells me she was in a different church the week before. And that church happened to have a good friend of mine from seminary as the intern there. And I asked if she heard him speak. And she said, oh yes, I heard him. I loved him. I didn't like you at all. And it was just a (laughs) wonderful opportunity. I was on cloud nine. I was done my first sermon. It it, it didn't hit me. But uh, when you speak of the the failings and the weaknesses in the early stages, and even now, uh, I guess that's why we added the words, um, seeing God preach in power in spite of our weakness, Uh, learning not to fear the fact that we're human, Uh, learning not to fear the fact that we'll make mistakes, that we'll we'll have times where we might have missed the context, we might have missed the passage. And that's horrible, and that's a sin before God, and that's detrimental for the church, but it's something Christ forgives. And to be able to have the students have the freedom to recognize their own weakness and yet go into the pulpit with confidence, trusting in Christ, I think that would be a big thing that was shaped by um, early mistakes and failures and continuing mistakes and failures in the ministry. How can our uh, preaching retain its distinctively confessional and reformed character without losing the attention of guests and uh, visitors who might be unfamiliar with reformed or even biblical language and categories? That's a great question. We really delved a lot on that. Actually, we spent a lot of time on that whole topic. Uh, A couple things to say right away. Um, Being Reformed and knowing the beauty of the Reformed faith doesn't mean we need to talk in inaccessible language. Um, We don't need to uh, use all the names of our theology all the time, and we certainly need to make sure when we do speak of our theology that we're showing the content uh, and not presuming. Whether we have people from outside the church or not, we have people of all different levels of maturity within the congregation. We have children. We have Uh, people who may be mentally handicapped. We have people who may have difficulty understanding concepts because not everyone has the same intellectual gifting from God. And the gospel in the end is a very simple gospel. Even the Reformed gospel is a simple gospel. It's beautiful, it's deep, it's rich, but it's not only for the PhDs. Uh, So we've spoken a lot of how to take moments to explain things, to take moments to catch people up, to take moments just to acknowledge there are people in the congregation who may not understand, may not know Jesus yet, and to address them, to let them know it's okay, let them know we're glad they're there, let them know that we're available to help, to explain a simple concept to them during the sermon. And that the preaching is not just effective in terms of what you say, but to try and teach the students that they're modeling a character for dealing with weak Christians or less mature Christians, and also that you're modeling a character for how to deal with unbelievers. If we constantly speak in the pulpit of unbelievers with a sneer, if we address unbelief only in terms of its uh, horrific nature, uh, we're not showing and we're not modeling how Christ responds to the worst of sinners. And so we're trying to teach the kids how to speak, the students, pardon me, in in the pulpit uh, in a way that recognizes fallen mankind, that recognizes the hardness of heart, but also loves them and tries to speak in a way that can reach them or at least let them have an ear to hear the gospel. And our focus has been through things like apologetic asides, uh, where you let the congregation know, I'm just going to speak for a moment now to those who don't know Christ. I'm going to take a moment to speak now to those who may not understand this term. Uh, Even pastoral asides, where you might stop the sermon in a sense and say, now I just want to address this issue that I know some of our members are facing right now. And how you can do that without losing the congregation, but at the same time capturing uh, the attention, the focus, the mind of those who may be uninitiated in the gospel. Hmm. What are some resources that pastors or even those uh, who might be listening, who might uh, anticipate taking seminary classes and preaching classes someday, what are some resources that they can use for uh, refining and improving their preaching? 
So in our class, we had a few books we used. Uh, we used uh, Princeton and Preaching by Gerritsen. Uh, but we had a bit of a focus also on a couple of books by uh, Pastor Zach Eswine. Uh, one was called Preaching to a Postmodern Everything, I believe. And the other was called Kindled Fire. Uh, those two books, they can be a little thick, uh, especially the Preaching to a Postmodern or Post All Everything, whatever book that is. Uh, that book is very thick. It has a lot in there. Uh, so we'd focus on sections of it and try to digest it. But that would certainly be a book that uh, would help people realize how to speak to others. But I think one of the primary ways to grow in preaching is to be mentored or whether you ever talk to your mentor or not, to listen to good preachers. Listen to preachers who are able to address unbelievers. Listen to preachers who are able to uh, be gentle in the way they speak and yet direct uh, and, and learn from them as they show us Jesus. That is uh, some great insight into this class and the subject of preaching. Uh, Reverend Bilsma, Greg, <laughs> thanks for taking the time out of your busy teaching schedule to join us in this episode. Um, but also thank you so much for taking the time outside of your pastoral duties up north in Canada uh, to come down here to Dyer, Indiana, to teach our, our students. Thank you so much for that. It's good to be here, Jared, and see a fellow Canadian thriving in the mid-America. Absolutely. We know how to do it, don't we? Well, next time on Roundtable, a few of our faculty members got together to discuss outreach. Until then, stay tuned.